I would say that pregnancy is the one time in a woman's life where collectively it's like all bets are off. It's an instant allowance that people feel like it's okay to make a comment about your body. Even if you think it's well-meaning and it comes with good intention, I don't understand why pregnancy allows any type of commentary, whether it's good or bad. Before we get into the episode, we want to give you guys a reminder because we love you and we hope you love us. Please, if you love the podcast, stop, drop, and go to the links in our bio because it is the Podcast Awards, the Australian Podcast Awards, and we are asking for you to vote for Life Uncut in the listener's choice. Now, having said that, we need to remember to go and put the link in our bio because it's currently not, but we're going to put it in there immediately after this. Did we not put it in last week's episode? Don't think it is. Oh, shit. (laughs) Well, (laughs) look, you could just Google it. Australian Podcast Awards. Thanks, guys, for voting. We appreciate you. Listener's choice. Life Uncut. Hit enter. Then go to your emails to validate the email. And sometimes the validation email might go to your junk. But that the vote does not count, unfortunately. They don't make it easy, but the vote doesn't count until you've gone into your email and validated it. It does only take a minute, Britt. Stop making it sound like it's really complicated and people won't want to do it. Do it. It's going to be the best minute of your life. Woo! Podcast Awards. No, it is only a minute, 100%. It's only a minute, but it's not just a click on enter on Life Uncut. You do have to go to your email. And I have to say that because the vote doesn't count unless you do it. That's true. Woo, Podcast Awards. Let's get into the episode. Hi, guys, and welcome back to another episode of Life Uncut. I'm Laura. I'm Brittany. Hi, Brittany. Hi, Laws. How's your weekend? (laughs) Did you just call me Laws? Hey, Laws, yeah. Since when? I always call you Laws. Is this you know real what? life? Actually. Have I have I been participating in this podcast for No, five years? it's it's quite like I, I have my moments. I write laws to you a lot in text or message, but on the podcast verbally I say Laura. I wanna point out though, in my life, if this is a thing that's gonna like get traction, you don't like you're it? the only person who's who calls I think Laws is for Lauren. I don't really see I don't see Laura's as Laws. Keisha calls you Laws her whole life. Oh, fuck guys, I don't listen not- to you. <laughs> For, for like three days. This is how years. I find out. It does make a lot of sense, yeah. Keisha. <laughs> what, what are your names again? Who am I? Keisha like? almost. Yeah, I, I, you, do you know why? Because I think for me, Keisha is a very, like I was only ever called Keisha by my parents when I was in trouble. And so I feel as though other people might have the same thing with their name. Like I don't call you Brittany. Laura to me just seems formal. Yeah. But you I don't shorten names though. I extend them. You're Kishi Pops and you're Britty Titty. <laughs> like I add syllables. I don't try and reduce from syllables. I give more. No, I, I I'm just invested say, in you. I say Keisha or Kishi, but I cannot stress this enough. From the day that Keisha has come into this podcast, she has called you laws. And the fact that you don't know that is concerning for everyone involved. I think it just felt <laughs> weird when you said it. Anyway, hey, um, my weekend was really good, guys. I went to the reptile park and the reptile park is f***ing lit. It was so fun. And I, okay, I think we should all get around this because I get to do things as a mum that I wouldn't do if I wasn't a parent. Like I would never, ever, ever as a 38-year-old woman go, we should go to the reptile park on the weekend. This is so funny because when Ben came to Australia, I took him there. (laughs) To the one in Avoca. We didn't take kids. No, I took him to a a zoo, but we went to the reptile section. So we drove. Oh, no. (laughs) I made him hold a snake. (laughs) Zoo, fine. Like, I mean, you know, adults go to zoos all the time. But this is like specifically a reptile park that is in the Central Coast, which for anyone who's not from Sydney, it's like an hour and a half drive from Sydney. I have driven past that reptile park a thousand times. I used to date a guy who lived in in the, the Central Coast. In like, the reptile was, park. He was, he was a blue, an alligator. He was a snake. He was great with his tongue. I dated Elvis the alligator, crocodile, whatever. Anyway, uh, I digress. So I've driven past it a million times and I've always thought, what a great reptile park. I should go there one day. But never as a non-parent did I get myself there. But on the weekend, I went with Matt. I went with the kids, Ash, Matt's podcast partner. Ash came with his wife, April, and their kids. And I... Uh, it was like dreams come true. I had so much fun. I love reptiles. Keisha hates them. I'm all about a snake. I love a lizard. I love the facts around turtles and spiders. And But there was heaps of other things. It's a bit it's misleading. It's a zoo, Laura. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Let's go back to the start. It's a zoo. It's a bit misleading by the name. It's a zoo. Okay. So I, I did do one thing that was a bit of a, a parenting fail whilst I was there, but it wasn't to my own children. It was to um, Ash's kids. So my kids love animals. They love snakes. Like Marley will run up to a python and wrap it around her neck 
deck. She has no fear. She'll pat anything. Is this in the backyard? She, in Australia, that's very concerning. We have eight of the nine deadly snakes in the world native to Australia. Is she doing this just at reptile parks? Or is she like... We live in Bondi. There's not many snakes in our garden. Yes, there are. Except for the boys. <laughs> She'll date them later. No, she will happily, like if we're at a reptile park, she's the kid that's at the front and will pat anything. She'll pat a baby crocodile. She'll pat the python. If you, if she's told that that's an okay one to touch, she will be in there and she will be touching it. She tried to climb. I was busy patting a kangaroo and I turned around and she was climbing into the enclosure where there was a tortoise. Thank fuck it was just a tortoise. Wouldn't move quick. <laughs> oh, my God. So she's very brave. Which I then just expect that all kids are kind of like beautiful, Marley, brave. just <laughs> oh, beautiful, brave, beautiful and brave. So we were walking through the park, and there's this one enclosure, which is the cassowary. You know, the big bird that's got like the horn on its head and the beak and the talons. And... Yeah, they can actually disembowel you. They're really dangerous. Yeah. So I told the kids that. So we were walking past it, and all the kids stopped, and obviously it's like got big blue feathers, and it's really beautiful. And the four children were there and they were like, wow, what's that bird? And I was like, well, it's a cassowary. They're super dangerous and they can attack people. But don't worry, that one's in an enclosure. And like my children were like, wow, that's cool. And then they just went on with their merry day. So the next day, so we go home, we all have a lovely dinner, like kids go to bed. The next morning we get up and I'm making breakfast in the kitchen and and Ash is there and April comes upstairs. And I was like, oh, how did you guys sleep? And they're like, well, actually, we were up all f***ing night because now Oscar's frightened of cassowaries and he thought he was going to oh, get no. disemboweled by the bird that was at the zoo. And they were angry at me and I did that. Well, sorry, Oscar, <laughs> but you need to know. <laughs> Toughen up, Oscar. Harden he's, the f*** up. He's four. Yeah, but you need to know because now he knows he won't go and try and hug a cassowary. I how, think that that's important. How many times in life have you come face to face with a cassowary? Funny you should ask. When I was up north in the <laughs> day, Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, but when I was up north in the Daintree, they actually live up there in the wild. Like that's that's their home, right? That's their habitat. But I didn't know. And you walk through these boardwalks, and I didn't know how dangerous they were. If I didn't read the big signs everywhere that were like this could disembowel you, I didn't grow up knowing that in fact a cassowary could kill you because it's like the closest descendant to a dinosaur. I think crocodiles are pretty close too. Yeah, that's not a fact that I said, but it's up there. It's like really close. If you Google it, it's probably top 10. It's up there with the blue tongue. So I, yeah, look, I didn't, I had a parenting fail, but I had a real parenting win, which was that I got to enjoy the reptile park. Okay. Fa- fantastic weekend. Recommend it for everyone. I had like a sort of reptile weekend as well, funnily. So was I Was it because your legs weren't moisturized? No, and do you know how many That's comments the third I got? Week in a row. <laughs> and she thinks that I'm the one that has the problem with it. Do you know how many people messaged me? I've really stretched it out. <laughs> so many people have messaged me off the back of socials and YouTube. And now every single time it goes up, they're like, knees looking great. That's what I get now. My DMs are full of people telling me my knees are great. Knees, fire flames. On the weekend, and this is where I think sometimes like, I don't know if I could be cut out for a parent. You know, you guys know I'm on this pendulum. One week I'm having it and I can't wait and I'm going to be the best mum. And the next week I'm like, nah, I'm swinging on this pendulum I mean, just be a good mum. You don't have to be the best one. We don't like overachievers I, I do. A, when I do things, I go all out. So I'm going to have to learn to cook and shit if I'm a mum. Like I'm going to commit to mum life if I do it. But I see the shit that goes into kids now. And it's when I think of our childhood and what we were doing, it's so extreme. Like my little nephew went to a birthday party on the weekend. So I went up to Port Macquarie to see my family and pick up Delilah. She's been having a beach holiday with my parents. And he had gone to a birthday party. He's not even two. And the birthday party was a reptile party, but it wasn't at a reptile park. Like they put these big functions on now and the reptiles come to you. Yeah. And I was like, man, we just used to have to get up really early to go and reserve the free public park bench so that we could set up. And then you'd give the kids a football, they'd run around for a couple of hours, you'd blow a popper and you'd go home. But now it's like people are hustling in animals and wildlife to these parties. It's very elite. Like kids' parties these days, like they are the place to be on a Saturday morning. So we went, we took the kids to a birthday party last weekend, I think it was. We were at the birthday party that was just in the gazebo in the park. Like, you know, it was it was great. There was balloons, there was bubbles. Like, it was a lovely party. The party next to us 
that was also in a gazebo had hired this thing. It was called like mini tradies. So this van had showed up to Bronte Park and they had unloaded all of these electric, like an electric forklift, an electric like little digger. And oh. then they had set up a an obstacle course for these little toddlers to get in these electric cars and things and drive around the course, which of course, all the kids at our party were like, what the fuck's <laughs> going on at that party? And we so all, that party. all of our kids left our party and were on the tour. And I kind of think if you're a parent and you've organised a party for your child in a public place, like a park. You can't come and show us up. No, no, not that you can't. You can't stop other kids from getting on the stuff. Like how do you police that system? This is a public park. But they let the other kids join, didn't they? No. As soon as the party started, they asked all the other kids to get away from the stuff. So then our kids are all upset because they want to be on the diggers. It was a whole thing. That was not the party to be at. That one was not lit. Well, my nephew also had to leave the party (laughs) because he was too rough with the lizards. He didn't understand. He was too small to have the reptiles. He's a bit of a, a Bowser, my nephew. He's a big boy. Which one is this? Bear. Well, not, <laughs> absolutely not named. Name. Absolutely <laughs> named. <laughs> I love him, but he's 100 miles an hour. Yeah, so he had to leave the reptile party. But it did make me just think, like, I just don't know how I could keep up with that. Like, I just want to go put my kids in sand pit that we had in the backyard. Like, that's what my dad did. He went and got buckets from the beach. He built a sand pit in our backyard, and that was what we did. Brittany wants kids that don't uh, talk don't, enough. They don't need anything. <laughs> I want kids Brittany that don't need wants, me. Brittany wants a plan. <laughs> I'm gonna have I'm gonna have the most independent kids. I want kids that I don't see until I'm 18. You're 18? No, till they're 18, sorry. That's, <laughs> that's terrible parenting. No, I'm joking, guys. You know what? I'm gonna get crucified when I actually have a baby. Everyone's gonna be like, send in the services, check on the kids. <laughs> hey, I wanna talk to you about nudes. Great. That from was a children's <laughs> reptile party. <laughs> Sorry. To nudes. That was a real hardcore pivot from a kid's <laughs> reptile park party to, yeah. I feel very comfortable around Keisha. Keisha and I, you have carpooled to work for years. She's with you now, Laura. We've, I've, it's your turn. But for years, Keisha and I carpooled to work and sporadically, sometimes we still do it. But part of uh, the carpooling is every morning I would get in the car. This is my only time to talk to Ben. So it became a three-way. So Keisha and I and Ben always used to just chat like a family. So I didn't ever have private time with Ben. But it's made me very relaxed around Keisha. Keisha, how do you feel about this? I feel fine because I feel as though, like I was your in case of emergency person and took you to hospital. So I feel as though I like, I'm already in the fold. You You're know? great at the sexting and stuff. He loves it. It's, <laughs> it's like when you're driving, you can't actually write the text. So you have to get the person who's in the seat to do it for you. And you're like, I am so wet. Keisha's like, what? You're like, just write it. She's like, like W-E-T, be- dictate this. <laughs> so how many times that Ben has like FaceTimed? And I'll answer but not look because I don't know whether he's going to be clothed or not. Yeah, but you the know, two he, of them, you're very like, you're into your sexy time. <laughs> yeah, but Keisha, even when we sex, sexy time, like visually, I don't answer the phone and he's got it on his dick. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't start like that. I don't, it's not like good morning and it's like but looking down It's like down I have to request barrel. that. I have to force him to show me. <laughs> yeah. Remember even if it was flaccid? No, this was just really funny and I was low-key offended and then I'm like, should I be offended or am I the asshole? So I, the other day, was going back through my phone and I was looking for a specific photo and during that time I stumbled across, across like a banging nude, like an, one of my banging nudes and I was like, I forgot about that, that's hot. So I sent it to Ben and I was like, he's going to wake up with a nude. He's going to be excited. Like, let's keep this alive. How old was the nude? Like, did you have red hair at the time or was it like a like a, no, pre, an archived nude? Pre-red era. Okay, right. No, it was archived. It was. Well, I yeah. didn't archive. I don't have a folder said, that says nude. Like an upcycled nude. It was was just, it from during the time that you guys have been dating or was it a, a past person's nude? No. <laughs> we were dating. You know when it was? It was when we were on our Life Uncut podcast tour and we were staying in one of the hotels. It was a great mirror, great lighting that day. I just woke up and felt it. I took it in the hotel. Fantastic. Happy for you. But I sent Ben the nude. But that's 18 18- a year ago, sorry, yeah. twelve months ago. Well, I just thought that was a pretty good time, and it was it was it was good enough to have rehashed it. So I send him the nude. He wakes up, ignores the nude, doesn't do anything, doesn't even heart it, and he just responds to something else. I said like maybe about a wedding email or something. So then we get on the phone. Excuse me, Keisha's in there. I'm like, do we want to talk about the nudes? And he's like, what, the old rehashed nude? I understand. I feel exactly the same as he did. There was zero effort from you for that nude. No, All there you wasn't. Did, totally. So why should he put in effort around receiving an old, unexcitable nude? Like, I'm not. If Matt I'm said, sorry. <laughs> even five-year-old titties deserve a double tap. 
A titty deserves a double tap. If I, out of nowhere, received a nude from Matt that was from two years ago and he just sent it to me, I think I would I would write back because it would be so out of character. But <laughs> if that did happen, like, I don't know what response. Wow, baby, you looked so good a year ago. Hot. Yeah. Oh, I'm so horny from a year ago. A year ago, me would have been so hard right then. I'm, like, what do you want him to say? You know what? If I could have written it, maybe, fuck yeah. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I didn't it's not like I went searching my phone for news right I just stumbled across it and was like oh, that'd be nice to wake up to Which, I don't know what I was expecting but then it, we got into this conversation poor Keisha was just sitting there and Ben and I were having this argument over nudes and then I was like Keisha what do you think Br- brought Keisha into the nude conversation but I think that any nude it wasn't pre-Ben it was a Ben nude it doesn't matter. Why it shows not? to me because you were like, it wasn't like I was thinking about it. I stumbled across it. You are not invested in the nude. So don't expect him to be invested in the thing that you're not invested in. I was invested enough to save it and resend it. I um, I wrote this in when we wrote We Love Love. This was a story that I told in the book. And so for anyone who has read the book, apologies for rehashing it. But my very first nude I ever received in my entire life was from my one-year situationship, who, funnily enough, I ran into the other day. Lovely guy, has a lovely baby and a lovely wife. that one? He's not still sending nudes. Yeah, he does not send me (laughs) nudes, no. He's also kind of like a relatively prominent media person. So, funnily enough, he wasn't at the time, though. Ha, internet, do your thing. So (laughs) Brittany, do your thing. Who? Yeah, neither of us know. So oh, he's like, yeah. God, I remember, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> so we had been we beep, we had been seeing each other for quite a long time, and he was away. He was in LA doing work over there, and I get this nude, and he had a f- very good penis. Like, well done for him. So I got this nude sent through. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't beep it. Maybe he'd, like, <laughs> he would, he'd love it. I don't know. He's like I said, he's in a different era of life now. So I get this nude, and and I see it, and I was like, wow, okay, that's confronting. I have a never been sent a nude before. Um, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about this. And then I looked at it, and on closer inspection, I realised. How, how close did you inspect when <laughs> like, <you> zoomed in? <laughs> when I zoomed in on the foreskin. No, I realised that the photo he had taken was from his apartment, but he was currently in LA. And so I then noticed I had been sent an upcycled dick pic. And I was like, so you've just been sitting on this. How long have you been sitting on this for? Like this. And then I realized the photo had was not, it was not a photo that was for me. He just had an archive of cock pics of like his best ones that he would just, you know, go in there, pull it out, send it off. That's offensive. Don't send me an upcycle. No, No, like that. If you look at, you know how sometimes photos have the information. If you go to information that says like 2012. It's not hot, right? Like it's, it's, it's yeah, not hot. It's not hot. So like, but also on one hand, it's not hot. But on the other hand, I appreciate the organization because there are times where you you're talking to someone and like things are getting hot and heavy, but you're at work and it's fluorescent lighting and you're not going to run into a public cubicle to take a photo of your labia. Like you're just not going to do it. Laura, <laughs> people don't just send their labia anyway. I know you don't send nudes, but I need to educate on it before you ever do. No, I used to. I used to send you nudes. Yeah, but you don't time. just pull a labia out and take a photo of it. Well, I might. <laughs> Let it fly. <laughs> no. But what, I'm, you imagine? what I'm saying. Hang on one second. Oh, here we go. No, Laura's, We're done with the labia joke. Laura's got, a, Laura's got her album ready to go if she wants a labiectomy. You know how she said she takes photos, but it also doubles as her nudes folder. So she's like, maybe the surgeon needs it, but maybe I need to send it to someone. That's a good angle. Matt will like that one. Multi-use. <laughs> Okay. The other part of this though is, is that I appreciate that sometimes the environment does not pertain to a nude. So therefore you've got to have them ready to go. You don't want to de-escalate when things are getting hot and steamy. You got to, you got to keep it going. And what am I supposed to say? Keisha, close your eyes. <laughs> well, yeah. The nude and then send it to him with Keisha yeah. sitting next to me. I feel very differently though, because if you're dating a lot and you're kind of like, if you were the type of the person who likes to send that kind of thing and you put a lot of effort into taking some really nice photos well, maybe the person that you sent it to wasn't worthy of it and you've started dating someone who is better and you're like, I'm not going to go through that whole process of, you know, putting on some nice underwear or even like getting the lighting right or take, taking more photos. It's just time consuming. This no, is efficiency. I disagree <laughs> because they should be worth Where the effort. Where about recycling oh, and reusing in they, Australia? <laughs> if you really like them, Keisha, and you think that they're better than the past, they should be worth that level of effort. Do you know how I used to like think I would get caught? Because I used to have a bank of them. You know how iPhones update and they like went from two cameras to three? <laughs> yeah. 
that was when I was like, fuck, this is how they're going to know because it's going to be a two camera. You know, like, you know how it's got the three cameras? Oh, because you do only selfie ones in the mirror. Well, yeah, if they were mirror ones, you would have the phone and I was like, I'm going to get caught. Ain't no guy looking at the amount of lenses on your camera when, you when you're sending a nude. <laughs> He's like, oh, my God, it's a two nipple and a two how, lens. How shit would my nudes have been if they were like, that's an old phone? <laughs> hey, there was something that came out over the, the weekend that I wanted to bring up with you guys. Now... This is something that rolls around every year that I wanted to talk to you guys about. It is new dating terminology that is coming out for 2025. They've really got a sort of head start on this. So if you're in the world of dating, you know that every year there's always new terms, like whether it's breadcrumbing or gaslighting or... Zombieing. Ghosting, whatever you... Like every single type of dating relationship or action has a name and a label for it now and there are new ones that are coming out in 2025 you know what i loved was it last year maybe even the year before i loved when dickmatizing came in you use that frequently i think we even named several episodes dickmatized was i dickmatized no i haven't Brittany, you have been dickmatized so many times what are you talking about you're still dickmatized you were meant to meet ben for a one night stand and now you're getting married (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is a valid point, Keisha. <laughs> well played. Um, no, digmatized. Yes, I'm digmatized now from Ben. Beautiful. But digmatized is not just like that you love the sex. It's that like there's a particular penis. No, is it not? Or no, I misinterpreted it's, the it's term? not specifically about the the penis. It's about the sex being so good that you're digmatized. And I feel like that's been a current theme. <laughs> digmatized now, just in case Ben's listening. Hundred percent. Okay, move on. <laughs> What's With fresh new- nudes. <laughs> With what are the new terms, Laws? All right. So number one, swamping. Swamping is when you find someone that you can comfortably share your swamp with. Britt, that's you and Ben. It's me because I'm a swamp donkey. donkey. I know. It's when you can let go of the pressure to be anything but your true authentic self and you can get down and dirty in your own swamp. It's so funny because I'm a, I'm a peacock for like two days. We know I peacock in the lead up. The first two days I peacock the shit out of that relationship and then I'm swamp donkey for the rest of the time. It's funny that you are allowed to call yourself a swamp donkey, but when I call you one or say that you look like Charlie Sheen, you get so offended. <laughs> Here we are with the Charlie Sheen again. <laughs> yeah, I am because it's one of those things where like, you're allowed to bully yourself, but other people aren't allowed but to. But you don't want people to hold a mirror up to who you really are. Well, it's Sorry. okay if I say swamp donkey. Like, oh, I'm feeling like a swamp donkey today. But when your friends are like, whoa, you are a swamp donkey, it hits different. Sorry. How about no, this okay. one? No habiting. When you choose to wait longer to move in with your partner because you value your personal space. No habiting instead of cohabiting cohabitating, uh, is, yeah, basically you enjoy being on your own so much that you prolong moving in together rather than rushing to move in together, which I think historically a lot of couples would do. I think that that's probably the trend of the future. I think since women have become far more independent, and I say that in terms of like long-term women independence and getting better jobs and opportunities, but I don't think we're as heavily reliant on people anymore. And I love that. I love that women are like, no, I want my own space. I want to do what I like. That's probably why I like long distance. All the codependents out there are like, not me. <laughs> Laura. Laura's like, what? What is that? What is independent? We've been dating for three months. I think we should move in together. I see this really working out. Is that what that, you do? That used to be me. Yeah. But no, not anymore, guys. I now live with the person I'm codependent with, so everything's fine. All right. Fiscal attraction is another one. And that's when you won't settle for anything less and you're seeking a match who is financially secure and who you find attractive. So fiscal attraction is finding somebody who you, I guess, you're not settling for in any way. And financially, they are matching you on that level. Hard one because it's very hard, hard to man. find someone who financially is at the same place as you are. Also available and attractive. Like they are, I'm all about your standards, but. And tall. The hat trick is high. I agree with this. Not that I think it's necessary to always date people who have the same financial, like that they're matched with you financially. But I do think that if that's something that's important to you, that will become a, an area for resentment. If you have mismatched finances and you're not able to take care of them properly. I mean, we know that statistically money is the second biggest reason that people break up. Mm. So it's not surprising to me that people are a little bit more obvious about wanting someone who's got similar money values to what they do. I think no. that's actually quite reasonable. No, I agree. But when I say like that's that getting that hat trick is high, I just say getting them all three at the same time. Like so, having somebody that is also available that you find attractive that also has a great job at that moment and the income that you want. But like sometimes they don't happen at the same time. So sometimes you find them, they're not available. Sometimes they're available, 
they've been made redundant, whatever it is, like getting that all three at the same time, especially I think as you get older, when yeah, the money I, comes. I don't know. I think that that's the whole point though, right? It's like waiting to be with somebody who is meeting you at the level that you're at rather than deciding to sacrifice on things that might be important to you. And I think, look, financially, I'm not saying that they have to be millionaires. What I'm saying is that they have to have a job. They have to have the security or the drive when mm. it comes to work that matches your drive. I think yeah. that that is an important one that people should prioritise in relationships. I really like this one because it's something that we preach a lot, but now it's got a, t a term for it. It's loud dating. And this is all about being upfront and clear about what you want in a relationship so that you're not wasting your time. And we speak about this a lot. I think a lot of people, and we know this from getting so many ask on cuts from you guys. So many of us are so worried about saying what it is that we want in relationships because we're fearful that if it doesn't match up, that person's going to walk away or leave us. Um, we're going to scare them off. But we're going to scare mm. them off. But the reality mm. is you should be excited to scare that person off because if they don't want the things that you want, you're just cutting to the chase faster and you're clearing it out so that you can meet someone who actually wants the same things as you. I do think there's a fine line. I do want to say that. I don't think you're coming too hot. How hot gate. is too hot though? How like, loud is too loud for loud dating? <sighs> It's hard because I want to be the person and I am the person that says, know what you want, let them know what you want. But you still have to be socially aware enough to not come out on the first date and be like, how many kids? When do we want them? Like, that's too much. But you can still, there is a, there's a really delicate balance of saying what you want without scaring someone off. Like, you don't want to go and yell in their face and, well, I want that! Like that's not loud dating. That's not loud. I, I want to make that clear. I don't think clear. anyone was thinking that. I don't, I don't think we were running the risk of any person listening to this podcast thinking that loud dating is screaming in their face. No, but I, I do. I think it's really important to convey what you want, but in a more delicate way. So maybe it's like, hey, I am looking for something serious. Are you? But that's not saying I have a 12-month plan of having kids because that might scare someone. But being able to say I'm looking for a relationship instead of a situationship that's different. So that's what I mean by finding the balance of loud dating. Like maybe loud, like think of wearing noise cancelling headphones maybe. I completely <laughs> agree with this, but I think that, and I exactly what you said, Britt, I think that there's a difference between telling someone that you want it with them and telling someone that you want it. So, I mean, you know, if you're having a conversation with someone and you're like, yeah, I, I, I want to have kids, that's not I want to have kids with you. I'm still figuring out whether I even like you or I'm invested in you. I'm just telling you what are the mm. things I want in my life. I think it's okay to lay those, like what are the big picture things that you want in your life out in a way that aren't and isn't putting pressure on that person that you're expecting it with them. I think that's okay. I think that there are a lot of, I know I'm talking very stereotypically here about straight men, but I think there are some men who hear that and just interpret it as, whoa, you know, she's already told me that she wants to have my babies. Like I Ew, think that, what a loser. which is not something that you would want to date anyway. But I do think that that's where women in particular have become a little bit more quiet about those things as to not scare off people because it can be interpreted in the wrong way. Yeah, I do agree. And yeah. um, this is another one. It's called marmalading. And so this is something that I think some of us can be guilty of doing at times and it's good to be aware of. Marmalading is when you put your significant other before anything else. So you've started dating, you're so infatuated with them that you prioritise them over everything else in your life, much like... Paddington Bear and how he prioritises marmalade over everything. We could call it honey in the same way that Winnie the Pooh does it for his honey. Isn't that cute? Wow. I like honey better because it's like a honey and they're your honey and then it's just all the honey. Look, I'm all about marmalading to an extent. No. But no, in terms of like making sure your partner knows they're important to you and loved, but not to the point that you sacrifice yourself and your well-being. Like, I mean, that's to me seems pretty obvious. Like you want to make your partner feel loved and important, but not to the point where you are just a sycophant and bow down to everything they want and that's unhealthy, that's yeah, toxic. Yeah, but people often put aside their friends. We've spoken about this before. They deprioritize other things in their life that would have been very important to them and are very important to them simply because this new person has come in and the excitement and everything else, they get so absorbed into their new relationship that other things that are critically important to their life go by the wayside. And so I think like th that's what the reflection of marmalading is. So we all have a friend who does it. We, I think some of us can probably hear that and be like, oh yeah, that's me. Hi, I'm guilty of that too. It's just something to be aware of. And then the last one that I quite enjoyed the definition for is digital expression. X as being like a different word, digital expression. Okay, pun, now, like this it. is the phase after a breakup where you finished mourning your ex and you've started using social media to share that you are confidently re-entering the dating world. 
I'm talking like when you start to see that someone's social media has changed freshly after a breakup, you've seen that they're posting photos out, like they're having a good time, maybe a bikini pic, things that would signify that they are single. That is what this is. It's digital X. Depression. Back in the day, it was Laura's quotes 100%. of like, tough times don't last, but tough people do. The birds, re- <laughs> the birds ready to fly. No, that's when I was in the depths of it still. Oh. Nah, titty pics came when I was at my right. expression stage. <laughs> you can tell, you can tell when someone's ready. But I love that. I love that. I love the confidence of being like, here I am. It's very obvious that I am now <laughs> single. Yeah, I remember when I did my single announcement after... The man who shall not be named Voldemort. Voldemort. No, <laughs> it always Dennis makes Voldemort. him sound so evil. <laughs> Jordan, he has a name. But I remember after that. We don't want to just call him the Voldemort of tennis, no? No, because he's lovely. He, he is nice. We do like <laughs> well, him. Voldemort's like the worst character in history. Oh, he, he broke your heart, so he's dead to me. He, he broke my heart, but he was lovely. But I remember I just went quiet for a while on the gram because I was in my room crying. And then my announcement photo was like what I thought was like a fire flame photo in a bikini on holiday in Thailand. And I literally, my caption said, tell me you're single without telling me you're single. But I actually had told them they're single in the caption too. I just wanted to double down in case people didn't get it. I think for you, because you were in long distance, it was harder to tell because usually what you do is you scroll back and you see the last time that they posted together, right? That's how you kind of check out whether someone's single again. But for you, it was harder because you used to post photos like that regularly you know Mm. like at the beach or whatever it would be normal because you're in long distance relationship and you made it beyond (laughs) that's why I had to clarify in the caption just to just so people really knew to double down I would love to know guys like surely we're not just all gossips because I whenever someone who I am friends with or someone who I know or it could be someone who's like you know media facing but usually not so much media facing because like that's that gets reported on you can kind of find that information out but when someone you know and you think they've gone through a breakup, but you're not sure. You think they have, right? So recently, one of our friends, I thought, I think they've separated from the husband. And so then I went on a deep dive on their social media. Like, it makes no difference to me. I'm I'm not going to reach out to them unannounced and be like, hey, just checking. You haven't posted in a while. Are you guys still together? Like, I'm not going to do that. That's weird. But do we all do this? Do we all go out of curiosity? Or oh, let's, let's scroll back to 2019 or oh, haven't posted for a while. Like, is that what we're doing? Yeah. Or am I fucked? So the other day I saw a friend that I was traveling with overseas many, many moons ago. She got into a relationship. They had a kid, whatever else. And then all of a sudden on my Instagram popped up her and somebody Just else. Just a random dude. Yes. And I was like, what? You're like, you've done this the wrong way. So I had to go back to figure it out for myself because I was like, I need to know when, why and how. Obviously, they're not going to say this is what happened, but I needed to know the timeline. And I went back and there was just one photo of the ex and then there was nothing for a while and then she's just with another person. But I have to die not knowing what happened, which is really hard. You should text her. I would never. (laughs) Hey, Hansel, you posted with another guy. So assuming you broke up. Just wanted to check you're okay. With Steven. Just, just, (laughs) she's like, that was six months ago. I hope you're all right. Wow. You seem like you're having a good time from Instagram, but I I just, I scrolled back for three years and just wanted to check. It's because somebody doesn't have to be in the media or famous or whatever else for you to be invested in their relationship. And like, I guess humans by nature are curious people. So when you know that something was solid, that they might have had a family, whatever. They've been together 20 years, whatever it is. You want, you're just invested in that relationship and you want to know what went south. Like, I think that's a supernatural curiosity. Are we all, like every single person, just gossip, just like closet gossips? Is that what For we really sure. are? Because we do preach about being above this, but then I then I find myself down a, a warren of someone else's social media and I'm like, why am I doing this? Yeah, I but hate I myself. don't want to know for gossip. I no. don't want to know to tell other people. No, 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 I no, want no, no. to know for my curiosity. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying for gossip, but I don't think gossip always has to be to then go and speak to another person about. What I think gossip is, is it's like to satisfy your own curiosity or your own like little storyline that you have happening. It's why we, you know, you might read all of the news articles that happen about someone. doesn't mean that you go and discuss it with another person, but you're into the gossip on that person's life. Yeah. And I also think it happens in reverse. I've had this happen to me recently. People thought I'd broken up with my boyfriend because I don't post much of him on social media because he's quite private. And I've had people message me like... (laughs) kind of asking if I want to go on a date and I'm like oh, oh just um just so you know like I actually live with I'm my partner. Still, I'm still in a relationship and they're like oh I'm so sorry I hadn't seen you post anything for so long so I just assumed that you'd broken up and I was like no no we haven't so 
everyone is doing it, whether they admit to doing it in a group chat or not, maybe that's a little bit different. Digital expression, maybe not 100% accurate. Sometimes people just might not be sharing on social media, but I think if they are sharing quotes like Laura's, you know, breakup situation that she used to share, that's a pretty clear sign. Yeah, nothing really gets you like a quote, does it? We'll know when you break up, Laura. Everyone will know. I'm pretty sure you'll know not because of the quotes, guys. No, I'll know because of the quote, the first quote that'll go up with, know your worth. To be fair, you'll know it. You, <laughs> Brittany, you knew, Brittany, that was weird. Brit, you knew I was pregnant before Matt knew I was I pregnant. Know. You will probably know that I've separated from Matt before he knows I've separated from Matt. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're like, just a heads up. Matt doesn't know yet, but, but it's over. I'm telling him on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking about gossip, something I want to talk about that just has me absolutely raging. Margot Robbie is heavily pregnant, as we know. I don't think anyone knows exactly how far she is. Six, seven, eight months. Who knows? Who, Who cares? Knows? Not our business. I mean, you do. You might remember we spoke about this when it when there was the photos, the pat photos of her in Cannes getting off the boat, and she had a bit of a bump showing, and everyone was like, "Margot is pregnant." Mm. It's her pregnancy announcement, and. Look, very happy to confirm because I know you've all come here for that. Margot is pregnant. But that was not the conversation we had when those photos came out. The conversation we had was that it seemed as though everyone's opinions around whether it is or isn't okay to comment on a woman's body went out the window and everyone was was talking about how she was pregnant, but she hadn't actually confirmed it at the time. And so we were talking about how that in and of itself was quite an uncomfortable conversation. But now she is very pregnant and she has confirmed it. So Margot doesn't have an Instagram account. I don't know if you guys know that. She, I don't think she ever has. She's got a private finster, like a fake one for her family and friends, but she's not out there posting these photos. She is living a, trying to live a very private, normal life. But the paparazzi don't give a fuck. So they follow her around. They take photos of her when she doesn't know and she's not aware. They put them on the internet and people comment on them. So there are some photos of her in a bikini, living her best life with her husband. She's probably in the south of France somewhere. Who knows? She's she's having a great time. She looks banging. She's just been for a swim. She's pulled herself up and she's sitting on a deck somewhere, living her best life. And so the comments... Prego in the ego. Yep. The comments off the back of this are so disgusting, almost entirely by men. But there's a social media influencer on Instagram called Alex Light. She's body positivity influencer. And she posted a video off the back of this that has gone pretty viral. So I want to play that for you. And she lists out some of the comments that people have been saying about Margot Robbie's pregnant body. Margot Blobby. F her husband for messing that up. She was a nine before, now a solid five. Body is clearly destroyed, but the beauty of life is unparalleled. That comment gave me whiplash. She's got the wide pregnancy nose now. Definitely over for Harley Quinn. Gross. I would never let my girl get that big when she gets pregnant. Well, there goes that. So these comments have come off the back of a couple of places on the internet where the photos have been posted. As Britt said, she doesn't have her own social media. So these comments have come from Reddit groups. They've also come from Twitter. And I think it's worth saying that, of course, there are lots of positive compliments and nice messages around the way in which Margot's body is changing. But I guess there's two questions to be asked here. And one is that, is it ever appropriate, whether it's a compliment or an insult, to say something about a pregnant woman's body? But what we're going to focus on first is obviously the negative comments that have come through from a from the dark hole of the internet that is full of misogynistic, horrible opinions around women's bodies. You would think that the one time that as a woman you could get off having your body scrutinised would be during pregnancy. You would think that that would be the one time that you were allowed a little bit of grace to – for, for, because there's so much that's happening to your body that you can't control visibly, not visibly, like everything is changing and it's changing daily. But to think that there are people who have this perception that one – potentially weight gain is controllable. Like I would never let my wife get that big during pregnancy. I mean, it's so minimizing. It's so harmful. And it's truly a revolting perspective to have on a woman's body. One that you have any ownership over what size she is at all at any point in time. It's not even the word big in that sentence, in that statement. It's the word let. Like, no, I would never let yeah. my wife get that big. Is wild. But to even me. the comment, like, you know, oh, she's got pregnancy nose now. Like, these are actual things that happen to us as pregnant people. Your face changes, your body changes, your feet change, your fingers change. Every single part of your body does change. And these are things that a lot of women feel self conscious about. I know I felt really self conscious when my face started to change during pregnancy. And it's because of all the water retention. Like, you do. Kind of just spread out. 
And I guess there's part of you that kind of feels like maybe other people aren't noticing it as much as I'm noticing it. So then when you do read that someone is criticizing literally the most beautiful person in the world who looks incredible and that they're not good enough during pregnancy, all that does is for everyone else is once again sets this incredibly unrealistic expectation and standard that well, when they're pregnant or people who are pregnant feel so insecure about the ways in which their body and their face is changing and changing so rapidly. Also, these are the same people that eight months ago were like, oh my God, literally this Barbie, this Margot Robbie is the most beautiful, flawless person on this earth. Like these are the same people. I mean, it may not have been. There's so many people when this is the problem though, right? When you were put up so high on a pedestal as Margot Robbie was during the time of her being Barbie, being the lead character in that movie, she was praised as the most beautiful person in the world, the most beautiful female in the in the world. The problem with being labeled that is that there is nowhere else to go but down. And so even at that time, there were so many people who would say, oh, she's plain, she's this, she's that. The commentary on one half were people saying how stunning she was. And then there were so many people who online were criticizing or critiquing the reasons why they thought she was not deserving of that title. And so all that's happened now is that because Margot is pregnant, she, it's not possible for her to uphold the own standard that she has been held to. She's no longer being seen and being treated as though she's the most beautiful person in the world because of the ways that her body has changed and it's out of her control. I recently read this exact comment from Adriana Lima, who literally, she actually had the title of the most beautiful woman in the world. She's Victoria's, she was a Victoria's Secrets model. She's a supermodel. She's stunning. She recently said, I never want to have that title again. I never want Mm. anyone ever to call me the most beautiful woman in the world because you cannot maintain those expectations and that people put on you. Like you don't even put them on yourself. But the second, I mean, she's had multiple children. She's fluctuated weight. And the second she does, she gets absolutely crucified for it. But it's even these like, even the people that have tried to like put a compliment in are hilarious. Body is clearly destroyed. But the beauty of life is unparalleled. Like as if that makes it okay. Like if that lasts, the beauty of life negates the fact that you just said she has destroyed herself. It's so, like it's almost comical if it wasn't so offensive. Yeah, and, and if it wasn't so dangerous. I think like the other part of this is is that it once again feeds into the narrative that women – are the most beautiful when they are, and I don't want to say the word because it sounds so outrageous, but when they're unspoiled. Like mums, middle-aged women are not as beautiful as young, virginal 20-year-olds. That's the social conditioning that we've been all led to. But I think it's really important to outline the fact that it doesn't matter what a woman does. It doesn't matter whether she's pregnant, whether she's not pregnant, whether she chooses to go childless. There is criticism regardless of what choice is made. And we've seen this with, if you don't have children, you're a childless cat lady. If you do have kids, then you're you're spoiled. Like you've ruined your body. Yep. If you let yourself age gracefully, you're old and unattractive. But if you stop yourself from aging gracefully, you've had too much work done. Then if you do try to have children and it's with a surrogate, that you're selfish for not wanting to ruin your body. But if you decided to carry it yourself, you've ruined your body. Like there is no way for a woman to win. Does that happen in real life though? Like to take this away from the celebrity nature of it, Obviously, conversations about women's bodies, you know, we are all constantly thinking about it. We've been brought up with diet culture and whatnot. It's something that I think takes up a lot of space in most people's minds. When they get pregnant, I can only imagine that that would be something that would be at pretty much at the forefront, something that you're thinking about pretty regularly, like my body's changing. Like you said, you go through all the changes of your hand, your nose, blah, blah, blah. Are people making comments in real life or is this just celebrity focus? No, I would say that pregnancy is the one time in a woman's life where collectively it's like all bets are off. It's almost as though being pregnant, visibly pregnant, it's an instant allowance that people feel like it's okay to make a comment about your body. Because you would never say to someone who is a bigger size, oh, like, wow, gosh, you're big. But you would say that to a pregnant Mm. woman, not you specifically, but people do. I think that pregnancy is probably the one time I experienced in my life where I noticed how okay the majority of people were with commenting on the way I looked. And it's as though I wasn't supposed to be pregnant because, oh, like, because you're pregnant, like you can't control that. So I can comment on it. And it works in both sides. Like it worked in terms of like people saying how small 
I, and I don't want to be like, I was really little during pregnancy. For a long time there, I was quite slim, but I had a belly and people would always comment on how slim I was still during pregnancy. For me, that was super triggering because Marley was really, really small and I'd already had a miscarriage. And so every time people would be like, but you're so tiny. I was like, I know I'm probably going to have another miscarriage. So wow. cool. Thanks for reminding me. And it just built this fear in me that I, that there was something wrong. And so every time I would go back and I would get checked and, and she was measuring a month smaller than what she should have been at that point in time. And she, Marley is tiny. She's the yeah. same size mm. as Lola. She's tall and skinny, but she's a tiny baby and has all always been underweight. That's just her build. Nothing has changed. But I think even if you think it's well-meaning and it comes with good intention, I don't understand why pregnancy allows any type of commentary, whether it's good or bad. Oh, well, that leads me to the question on, do you think it is better or okay to still say positive, what you deem as a positive compliment? than say nothing at all? I think you can say you look fantastic. I don't think you need to comment on any sort of actual physical attribute. Because I would say, oh my God, you're glowing. I would say that. Or I would say pregnancy suits you. Or any, maybe I'm offending people and I don't know it. But their comments that I would make to someone, I'd be like, oh my God, you are glowing. As if like, because that doesn't have to be a physical thing. That can also be a like, you've just got a great energy. You've got a great vibe. Like this is just suiting you, you know? Yeah, I get that. But also on the flip side, I mean, you know, pregnancy suits you is the implication that pregnancy doesn't suit most people. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that that's the... I don't think that's the implication. I think it's just a nice way of saying to someone like... You look fantastic. You look fantastic. I yeah. don't think there's anything wrong with saying that someone looks fantastic if they're pregnant because probably... They I probably mean, need the compliment. Majority of people don't feel that fantastic. <laughs> I think that sometimes where we go wrong is what we think is a compliment isn't. And mm. complimenting someone's baby bump or saying that, that it's sitting low or it's sitting high or it's big or it's small. Like I, I think most people think that telling someone that they hardly look pregnant is a compliment, but for a lot of people that's not, that's not something that they want to hear or they're really self-conscious about it. I've never... Asked actually thought about the fact that it could be a real fear that someone had suffered a miscarriage. That just hit me like a ton of bricks. When you just said, when people would say that to me, it just reinstilled this fear that I already had that I would have another miscarriage. I have never even considered that that might be the case. It's making me like, it's making me question what is the best thing for me to do? Because I don't want to go up to someone who's very obviously pregnant and not say anything about it. Because that seems like a little bit insensitive. That seems like I'm not paying an interest into their life. Like, is it better to maybe ask a question? How are you going with it? Yeah, how are you like, feeling? Yeah, I mean, being pregnant and the way your body changes is not something that you have control over. The other thing that I found really common is people would ask me how much weight I'd put on. How much weight have what? you put on being pregnant? They literally wanted to know the kilos of weight I had put on. That's weird. I've never heard that. That happened so frequently. And I just think that, like, you would never ask a, a woman that in any other version of life. How much weight did you put on? You may ask someone if they've had dramatic weight loss and they're talking about it really openly. You might ask that specific question, but I don't know. I just think unless you're it's someone who you're really close with, I think that we probably should treat pregnancy a little bit differently to how we do. And, and you never know whether someone is going to be offended by something or totally cool with it unless you're close to that person. And I would say that there's so many women out there who have been offended by older generations. It's often mother-in-laws, unfortunately, or, you know, older aunties or who will say like, oh God, you're, you look huge or whatever it is. Because in that time, it used to be okay to speak like that to people. But I do think overarchingly, we have a little bit more self-awareness now around it. I was just watching an interview that uh, Kate Winslet did. So she's in a movie that has just come out now. It's it's around like a World War II photojournalist. So it's based on a real story and Kate portrays this woman. Didn't she do a podcast? Was it a podcast episode? Oh, she's doing the media train. So it was actually a Vogue, in, it was a Vogue interview, but yeah. she has also done Elizabeth Day's podcast. She's doing a lot of media at the moment, but this I read in, in the Vogue interview, but she was talking about how the fact that she, I hate the term, but she's a middle-aged woman. She has been on our screens forever. She is a brilliant actress. When she was doing a topless scene in the movie, someone from the movie came up to her and told her to suck her belly in so she had less rolls. Like somebody literally still in this day and age came and said to her, suck in, I can see your rolls. And she said, I, I know you can see my rolls because I have rolls, because I am soft. She literally said, because I don't work out to within an inch of my life and because I'm playing a character in World War II that didn't do reformer Pilates seven <laughs> days a week. Like that's what she was just like, this character didn't do that. And I'm more, 
I am more about embracing who I am and I'm happy to be who I am. And she's really publicly fighting now the idea that we're so brave when we don't wear makeup. We're so brave when we show our roles. And and she said, I'm not brave. I am not. I'm just alive. She goes, I'm not working in the Ukraine on the front line. Literally what she said. She's like, that is brave. Me having a role and living my, <laughs> she's like, what the fuck? Like, and I just love seeing it. I love seeing her. She aged, she's aging gracefully. I even hate that but term. Even but that, she's what just the fuck does that mean? I aged gracefully. I just because aged. Yes. I'm just, I'm just growing. That's life. Like uh, the years go by, but it's. It's crazy that we still have to have these people that are so brilliant at what they do and so beautiful. And there's still people, not only the public, but it's still coming from the other side too. It's coming from the production. Yeah, absolutely. It comes from within industry. But the reason for that is because it's not so much that we think it's brave. And maybe that is a a part of it. But also I think it's because we've been conditioned to think it's offensive. Like that it's offensive to see somebody who is like not fit on our screens. We're We're so not used to it that it's shocking to see a couple of rolls and a bit of soft skin. I think something that's even more complex about the Kate Winslet situation is that people inevitably are going to draw a direct comparison to the scene that she did in Titanic. You know, 25 when she was years like, ago. Exa- but that's exactly <laughs> what I mean, like topless scenes. It's so gross that I know that this is going to happen where people are going to be like, oh, wow, you know, like here's the side-by-side images of what she used to look like then and now what she's looking like in this World War II documentary-style film. It's so grossly predictable. Yeah. Like I'm not shocked that someone in production was like, oh, just so you know, you know, they probably weren't even doing it with horrible intentions. They were probably doing it because most – actresses have been conditioned to be want to be told those things by production. But isn't it just so ugly that, that we have these this whole idea of before and afters? Because there's only a couple of kinds of before and afters, right? It's a glow up. It's a, this is the person before and here's the clear and obvious plastic surgery that they're denying that they've had. That's the before and afters that we often see. Or it's a before and after where it's someone's become objectively less attractive by society standards. And usually that's because they just, it's 20 years difference. Like, yes, of course that there's going to be a before and after. If you look at pictures of even me from when I was on The Bachelor, like I was going back in photos recently. I look like a different. (laughs) (laughs) Same. I was looking for Bachelor nudes. No, I look like a different person. My face, I was so youthful and I was so round and so voluminous 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 in my cheeks that I look like a different person and then I had children and I haven't slept and now I look the way I look and I'm I'm happy with it I'm you guys think I'm saying this you are very brave I'm so brave every day I get on this (laughs) podcast and share my face but no I think like the standards are so we all know they're so unrealistic but I think it's so important to kind of do those comparisons like we said where you're like okay well if you don't have kids what's the backlash if you do have kids what's the backlash if you get plastic surgery what's the backlash if you don't get it then you get old what's the backlash like there really isn't a place that as a woman you can go to without experiencing some sort of commentary around how you didn't do it well enough or how you could do something better or change something about yourself I love that she sort of went down this track instead of labeling her actions as courageous she suggests alternative descriptors she literally said let's come up with some other words like relief at seeing normal women feeling joyful on the screen But on the flip side to this, and I don't want to contradict what she has said and what Kate Winslet feels by this, because it must be very patronising to be told that you're being brave for simply presenting yourself as you are. But there has to be some people who go first. And the reason why it is brave is because so many women in Hollywood would not do that. Firstly, they wouldn't allow themselves to get soft in the first place. They would do the Pilates the seven times a week because so much of their self-worth is wrapped up in how their body and how their looks appeal to the wider population. And I think that in saying, I don't want to say it's brave by any means, but I think that there isn't enough visibility of it on our screens and that's what makes it seem brave. See, I think this is very interesting when you talk about these new technologies that are being used on things like, I mean, and this has not been reported because the people who do this type of editing are under the tightest NDAs in all of Hollywood. It's really obvious to me that it exists on Morning Wars, you know, the TV Mm. show with Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston. They have this like, uh, there's an actual word for it. It's something to do with like visual effects. Essentially, it's photoshopping each individual 
character if they have it in their contract. It's really, really expensive. That's why only some people can have it. It's so obvious if you go back and watch Morning Wars that Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston both have it and no one else in a lot of the scenes do because you will see normal skin texture on the person next to them and right side by side, you will see that they are absolutely flawless and wow. they are photoshopped within mm. an inch of their life. And there are people whose entire careers that are to fix, you know, and I'm putting that in quotation marks, to fix the imperfections of these actresses. And the kind of double-edged sword of that is that they feel as though they have to look like they did 30 years ago to keep getting the contracts of being the main actress. But and I so hate like, that because Reese, Reese Witherspoon is the one who has her own production house and creates these opportunities for women who are quote unquote middle-aged. So then trying to to appear or present as though you're younger than what you are, is kind of the antithesis of that. So it doesn't, for me, that's a contradiction that sort of goes against the values of what it is that they're trying to create in the first place. And like you said, someone has to go first. Yeah. So it's like, are they risking not getting the opportunities because people are going to comment things like, oh, wow, they're, they're past their expiration date. I don't want to see them on my screens anymore. I'm not going to watch their shows. I'm not going to watch their movies. I think like every single component of this, it's all linked in together. There's so much commentary around the expectations of what women are supposed to look like. There's so much expectation of what we are supposed to provide to the men on the internet that think that Margot Robbie has ruined her entire acting career and her body because she's chosen to have a child. I don't know how we escape it. And I, the one thing that I have really liked and enjoyed that I've learned from this conversation is about commenting on women's bodies when they're pregnant because mm. I, in my mind, kind of had the belief that a lot of women say that they struggle with body image during pregnancy, so maybe I'll try and counter that by giving them a compliment. Kish, you know, maybe if I I'll get pregnant, give me as many compliments <laughs> as you can. Say whatever you want. <laughs> I Do you think know, that was my kind of understanding though and it's, it's just good to hear the other perspective of like why that might not be the best idea. Yeah, and I think so many women do struggle with their bodies changing during pregnancy, especially because we have grown up in this immense diet culture, body weight and the way our bodies look for a lot of people, absolutely not for everyone but for a lot of people is something that they have had control over or feel as though they need to have control over. And so during pregnancy, there is so much that happens that you are lacking control over. And so for anyone who has had disordered eating, that is like a very, and can be a very frightening thing. And also just, you know, everything around your identity is changing and you're bringing this baby into the world. And it's like, I guess this feeling of losing yourself a little bit or lo losing who you thought you saw. And that's definitely not the case for everyone. Some people love being pregnant. My sister, for example, absolutely. Like if she could just do the pregnancy part and not the having the baby part, she would be pregnant all the time. She, she loved wouldn't have mine. She, she'll be your surrogate. <laughs> she loved how her body changed. She felt really beautiful yeah. pregnant. And then there are some people who are like, I feel anything but. And so I guess like the thing is, is you're never going to know how someone feels about their own pregnancy. But, and I think like the, one of the biggest points and take homes from this is that being beautiful is not the reason why people are put on this earth. And men who have the audacity to comment on Margot Robbie's pregnant body are making the assumption that the most valuable thing that she contributes to this earth is the fact that she's beautiful, not everything else that she has. Strap in, kids. We have a brilliant Accidentally Unfiltered. Oh, and I love I it when love, they're good. Oh, I love it. How embarrassing on a scale of one to ten? Very funny. You would recover, but it's funny. How long would, would it take to recover? <laughs> a while. All right, let's go. <laughs> My friend and I were spending time with two guys and we got into the conversation of party tricks. I explained that my party trick is that I can do a headstand on people's lap. Now, don't ask me how she discovered that she could do that. Only if they're sitting down. So if someone's yeah, sitting like this. I could this, do a headstand on your lap. We can try after. We'd all had a few drinks, coupled with laughs and music. So naturally, we thought this was the time to see if I could do my party trick. <laughs> I popped my hands on this guy's knees and flipped myself upside down on his lap with my shoulders on his legs and my crutch up to the sky by his face. Thanks to the liquid confidence, I decided to do one more. I decided to show off my synchronized leg actions and obviously ended up sucking in a bit of air because then I dramatically <laughs> swung my legs back together for the finale and I queefed directly into this man's face. <laughs> it's not, I don't even think she knows him. I just think it was at a party. I think there's a group of people hanging around. Well, he just got a real twofer of a party trick. A headstand and a queef. Imagine being queef, queef in the face queef by a queen. stranger <laughs> at a party. Like it's not what was on your bingo card that night. Queef queen. Can we get that trending? She's amazing.
it was so funny for me. It's like the finale, the synchronized leg finale. And it's just like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, look, what is your suck for the week? My suck for the week, I went to Port Macquarie to see my family. And Port Macquarie is like a beach capital of Australia. It's phenomenal beaches. It's beautiful. But every time I've gone back there lately, it's been like horrific thunderstorms. It flood rained the whole entire time. Flood rain? Like, I, I, you know, like hardcore rain unrelenting rain. So that was pretty shitty. And my suite was just spending time with my family, seeing my little nieces and nephews because I don't get to see them often. So it was just one of those wholesome weekends. And I got Delilah back. You got Delilah. I was going to say, did you just forget about Delilah, your child? No, I don't. But I just don't think people care about Delilah as much as I they care about Delilah. They absolutely do. Brittany just put her in a sand pit and was like, fend for yourself, Delilah. I'm not <laughs> paying for that expensive birthday party. Um, my suck for the week is I currently have an ovarian cyst, which is very fucking annoying. Mm. It's been something that I have been dealing with for the last couple of months, but over the last week it has gotten so bad and so painful and it sucks. Yeah, that does And that is my suck. And my sweet for the week, this is a very random sweet, but hear me out. So yesterday we'd gotten home from the reptile park. We'd arrived back in Bondi and I was going down to the cafe with the girls to get something to eat. And as we walked past, this one house had put out all this crap that they were clearly trying. Instead of taking it to the salvos, which I'm really against, don't put, just put shit on the side of your house as rubbish because then it ends up just like getting blown down the street and everything else. That's what this person had done. However, however, in this instance... We were walking past and Marley saw these two little notebooks and they are like a notebook that inside it all had like little dolls drawn into it. And then you ca it came with stickers and you can stick their clothes on so you can create little different fashion outfits for these pictures in the book. So she was like, mommy, can I have them? And I was like, yeah, fuck, whatever. But normally I'd say no to collecting things off the side of the road. So here she is. You have collected loads off the side of the road. That's don't pretend right now that toys, you Toys, toys. You've kids also stolen people's real stuff that you thought was on the side of the road. Did I? Yeah, you took their pot with a pot. Oh, yeah, yeah. I still it, have those. Look. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I normally say no to the kids taking like books and things from the side of the road because we have so much stuff in our house. But on this occasion, I was like, yes, okay, these two little books full of stickers, take them home. I cannot tell you the amount of joy that these two little like upcycled books that they found on the side of the road have brought these kids over the last two days. They woke up this morning, 6 a.m. And the very first thing Molly said was, mommy, I want to go down downstairs and do my notebook and she ran downstairs and she sat there so she did three hours yesterday and another two hours this morning brilliant doing her little sticker notebook from this person who was throwing it out as junk on the side of the road and it was like it's she wants one for Christmas like it is like her most favorite thing that she owns at the moment and that made me really happy that's why they say one man's trash is another man's <laughs> is treasure. Is Marley May's treasure. Yeah. Um, and that is it from us, guys. Look, if you've loved the episode, if you've loved any episode, go and vote for us in the Australian Podcast Awards. It's a Listener's Choice Award. We will love you forever. We already will. Even if you don't vote, we still love you guys. But we'd love you even more if you did vote. Um, the link no, is vote. in the bio. The link is also in the show notes. Once you have voted, you have to then go into your emails and verify the vote. Very important. Last little kind of finicky bit of details and that's it from us you know the drill tell your mum tell your dad tell your dog tell your friends and share the love because we love love